Blessed be your name. And I worship you. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see all of you coming on board. Sophie, I can see you. God bless you. Victor Ward, Mary. Hey, I've missed you. Karibu sana. It's good to see you. So let's keep on coming on board. We are just about to begin. As you come online again, remember to tag a friend. Remember to also go ahead and uh, start a watch party or share. If you cannot start a watch party, please do share. Let somebody join in and be blessed. Also, I won't mind to get to know where you're watching from. Send in your comments. And also, your participation would actually be a blessing. Joseph, good to see you. Karibu sana. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. Wow, we thank God that God has been able to cause this day to be. We appreciate him for his favor. And I think we are going to just be beginning off without really taking much time so that we can be able to cover as much ground as we can again please as you're coming online i want you to also do me the favor of just going ahead and also tagging a friend sharing or even beginning a watch party if need be my name is reverend pancras Ngira. it's a blessing to always be together with each one of you guys and uh besides that if in case this is your first time to join us this program is known as Therapua. Uh, it's a program that has been a blessing to very many people, both within this nation and across. And we praise God for the impact that it has been making. Therapy was simply is the same word therapy, which speaks of a healing and speaks of also a restoration of health and at the same time impacting, imparting life in the hearts of very many people. Regina, I'm glad to see you. Elizabeth Mutua, good to see you too. So today we want just to start the program this entire week. We are still going to be dealing with the hope, but on another level where we are dealing with the hope, the anchor of our souls. The previous week I've been dealing with the hope and I've actually been majoring uh, on hoping against all hope. We've been looking at Romans chapter 4 and verse number 18. Uh, the scripture talking to us and explaining to us how Abraham was able to hope against all hope. That even when hope was seemingly not working, he still believed in hope. And uh, most of the times whenever we are actually dealing with hope, there are many times that people are actually greatly affected. And I say this, I'll repeat it again. I've been dealing with in this office with many people that have been coming to see me. Uh, there are people who are suffering great depression, discouragement. Guys are actually giving up. There are people having suicidal thoughts. Several things have been happening to people ever since 2019 and more so in 2020. You know, I remember I actually told people that there were three spirits that I felt released from 2019. The first one was a spirit of irritation. People have actually been suffering a lot of irritation. People are easily offended and people easily feel irritated and just want to give up and call it quits in several things. The second spirit I actually noticed that was released was a very strong spirit of bitterness. Many guys have actually been beaten. The third one that has actually been released very strongly is a spirit of depression. And these things, we actually need to go ahead and deal with them. Let me say this, that while we're dealing with therapy, one of the key things that we have to focus on is internal healing. People need their souls restored and their hearts actually healed. Many guys are actually walking and whenever you see them moving physically, you might think they are doing okay. But really, on the inside, people are broken. And unless God comes in to help them, my friend, we are actually going to see a generation doing all manner of evil. We were watching news yesterday, and while we were looking at it, we were actually seeing how a certain young girl in university was actually killed by the boyfriend. And you've noticed that these problems or these uh, situations have become a bit more rampant. So the seasons we are living in darkness seems to be increasing. But guess what? God is still speaking the word of hope because in the midst of all darkness, light is still shining brighter. So I'm glad that you've been able to join me. Jacinta, it's always a blessing to have you. I'm glad that you've been able to join me and we are still dealing with this topic entitled hope. But I want us to pray just as we are beginning in the name of Jesus. So Father, we appreciate you that you've given us such a moment. And I'm asking that God, you will release oil upon my head like never before. Cause me to speak your word, Lord, in our flow of revelation more than ever before. Let your word make an impact in the heart of everyone that is listening today. And let it elevate the lives of people out of spheres of discouragement, spheres of depression, spheres of darkness into 
into spheres of hope, spheres of light, and spheres of renewal. I thank you, Father, because your word will flow forth with revelation today. In the name of Jesus, it will be unbroken. In the name of Jesus, it will be fresh, and it will make an impact. Thank you, because indeed your word is true in Jesus' name. And I believe there's an amen somewhere in Jesus' precious name. Again, as you're coming online, please take the moment of being able to share or also tag in a friend if you can. I mean, Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 17, yesterday I began to speak on hope, the anchor of our souls. Hope, the anchor of our souls. So Hebrews chapter number 6, I will start with verse number 17. I'm reading all the way to verses number 19. So the scripture says, We are in, we are in God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things now that word two immutable things there if you look at it the word immutable the two immutable things there is the promise and the second one is the oath the promise and the second one has to do with the covenant so the bible says the two immutable things in which it was impossible uh, for God to lie, which might have a strong we might have a strong consolation, uh, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Verse 19 is my emphasis. The Bible says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into the within, uh, and we, I mean, which entereth into that within the veil. So I'm talking about hope, the anchor of our souls now if you've been following me through i've been dealing with the hope again as hope i made an introduction by defining what hope is i spoke about pointers of hope i spoke about partners of hope seven of them in number i talked about experience rejoicing uh, peace love revelation patience and the power of the holy ghost who are partners of hope and then now later as i began this week now i began to deal with what i called a hope the anchor of our souls now Yesterday, I made a statement which is very critical, and I stated that hope must not just be a spiritual thing. It's not, it shouldn't be a thing that abides in your spirit only. Hope should be translated from your spirit man into your soulish realm. Uh, in other words, one of the things that we have to understand is that uh, your spirit man basically believes and understands whatever God has already orchestrated, planned, and intended concerning your life and destiny. Uh, so that means your spirit man really does not have much of a problem. The moment you got born again, uh, according to the book of Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 14, your spirit man came back to life. In Titus chapter number 2, the Bible's chapter number 3, the Bible says he was regenerated. So there was a comeback to life of your spirit man. So your spirit man has ability to decode the things of God, the promises of God, to understand it and also to be able to believe it. But the battle in your life basically lies within your soulish realm, where your mind is, where your thoughts are, where your perceptions are. And this is where I was able to explain what the soul basically carries. And there are five things the soul bears. Number one, the soul possesses your mind. Number two, the soul possesses your, your, your emotions. Number three, your intellect. Number four, your emotions. And number five, your desires. The five things that the soul basically possesses are the five things that the enemy will utilize to fight the life of an individual. When you study the Bible, you will realize when Paul is speaking, saying that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but that they are mighty through God, he explains in verse number five, that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, pulling down strongholds. And he says, casting down imaginations so the strongholds that paul is talking about here are not atmospheric strongholds but they are soulish strongholds let me say this the greatest devil you can ever fight is not an external devil but more so an internal devil the internal battles you fight in life are more stronger more weightier more than the battles you will ever fight on the outside that's one of the things that you have to understand that therefore it means that if you can win your battles on the inside there's a guarantee that you've automatically won it on the outside in fact 80 percent of your victory in life starts from the inside. 20% is only a manifestation of what you have already been able to cover on the inside. So which means also 80% of your defeat is an inside affair and 20% of the defeat is simply the manifestation. So beat your battles on the inside and you will find out that you can beat it also on the outside. Did you ever know that salvation is more so an internal affair? A Jewish man argued with a Christian. He said, I mean, Christianity is uh, it's an inferior religion as compared to Judaism. And he kept on proving himself. He says, we Jews tie 30% of our earnings. You should know that. Jews don't just give 10%. They literally practice about 30%. We Jews pray three times a day. He kept on giving the reasons why Judaism is a superior religion. After he was done, the Christian guy looked at him. He told him, this is the reason why Christianity is superior. 
Then he explained to him. He said, we as Jew, I mean, we as Christians don't deal with outside things. While you Jewish people, it has to be that somebody has to be caught in the act of adultery so that he cannot be accused. In Christianity, it is just your sight and your imagination that causes you to commit it. And so the moment he spoke like that, the Jewish man became a bit affected. He didn't understand what he meant. He said, listen, we deal with life on the inside before it comes on the outside. And the moment somebody deals with life on the inside before coming on the outside, naturally that type of person is a victor. And that's one thing that Jesus continually repeated. He would say, whoever looked at, whoever hated, he was speaking about your inner dealings. And he knew very well that therefore if a man constantly understands that we live in the unseen before we can actually manifest into the scene, then such a type of person literally makes an impact in the scene realm. So as a believer, you have to understand that hope must not remain in your heart or your spirit realm. Hope must also be translated into your mind. You must have hope affecting your, your mind, affecting your emotions, affecting your intellect, affecting your willpower, and affecting your desires. The moment hope is translated into that realm of life within you, you will notice that automatically your power to survive changes of life and changes of times and seasons is automatically given to you. For example, there are times you can wait on God for things that God has been able to tell you. And as you're believing him and waiting on him for those things, it would seem as though it's not coming to pass. Did you ever know that one of the best ways to actually stand in that process is not just by having faith in your heart, but allowing your faith to find its completion or your hope find its completion by allowing your mind to meditate on the things that God has ordained. Let me show you a scripture in Hebrews chapter number 11, uh, just before we come back to Hebrews chapter, uh, number, uh, Hebrews chapter number 6 again. But I want you to look at Hebrews chapter number 11 and see what happened to the patriarchs of faith and how some of them by faith translated into the things of God. That's why I said hope has to be also a mental affair. Your hope has to become the anchor of your soul, not just your spirit. Your soul has to be affected by hope, your mind again. So look at the book of Hebrews chapter uh, number 11 and I want you to check this out uh, in verses number 13 uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 13 the Bible says this all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off were persuaded of them and embraced them look at how it continues it says and confess that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth verse number 14 for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country verse 15 and truly if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned so you notice that this scripture basically tries to explain to you that there's something that happened to these people that by faith they were translated into certain realities and the realities that they actually had came in through experience experience number one is that they saw it afar off which means they envisioned it number two they were persuaded which means they are hearts and their minds became convicted of it number three they embraced it you know that means they began to envision and to actually begin to uh, see these things in all possibilities and then they began to confess it now if you look at verse number 16 it says but now they are desire i mean they desire a better country that is a heaven that is heavenly wherefore god was not ashamed to be their god uh, for he had prepared for them a city so notice that their faith in this sense we are talking of hope had actually translated them to a certain possibility now let's go to hebrews chapter number 12 then we will go back to hebrews chapter 6 today we are going now to be going deeper we'll be dealing with the promise aspect and the oath aspect Look at Hebrews chapter number 12. I will begin with verse number 1. My emphasis will be verses number 3. The Bible says, Who seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do it so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, verse number two, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father of the throne of God. Now look at verse number three. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become wearied and faint in your mind. Faint in your mind. So notice what he's actually trying to explain here 
here that there are possibilities that people can faint and their fainting here is in their soul their minds can actually faint he says consider jesus look at how much contradiction he actually faced he faced contradiction in that he was an innocent man and he was hanged on the cross and persecuted and killed for sins that he had not committed he was accused for things he had not done but with all contradiction see how he handled himself that he endured the cross and he despised the shame and then he explains that the reason why you actually consider jesus is so that you too can handle your own contradictions in life you know sometimes when you're hoping and you're believing god for certain things things go contrary to what you're actually expecting the word contradiction simply means contrary to the things that you're actually expecting so you'd find out that you believe in god you know like in the bible when the bible talks about hannah and penina the introduction of the book of first samuel chapter number one you, the, the scripture would actually say uh, how hannah was actually loved and she was given a double portion the introduction of that scripture basically should teach you that therefore the first wife of elkanah was actually hannah and not penina penina was actually the second wife but if you check out that scripture why the bible tries to give us that setting and tries to show us how much the husband loved him and yet even with loving him and giving her and loving her and giving her a double portion uh, hannah still suffered of barrenness and still could not be able to get a child so there was a contradiction to an extent where even the husband tells hannah that i aren't i meant i to you like 10 sons i mean you should know i've loved you even more than penina but this contradiction kept on disturbing this woman and that is when this woman had to get into warfare i don't know whether you've ever been in a place where you've done everything correctly paid your tithes, given your offerings, fasted and prayed, kept yourself pure. I mean, you did everything that was necessary to do. Uh, whether people taught you on midnight prayer, you are able to do it on spiritual warfare. You are able to do it. You broke what need to, needed to be broken. Uh, you kept correct. You submitted where you needed to submit. You did everything you needed to do, but things seem to be working contrary. That's what exactly the Bible says. It says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself so that you may not be where and faint in your mind because if you faint in your mind then automatically you cannot find progress listen your soul needs to find hope and when your mind and soul is able to find hope you will notice that your hope finds completion and the circuit of that completion is empowered enough i want you to remember that and because most of the times we walk through a lot of contradictions in life i mean you do this but things go the opposite and yet you're wondering god is it that you actually aligned to me or something is not correct what is it that i've not been able to do a pastor came to tell me, Pastor, I've done everything I know to do, but there's nothing that seems to be working for me. And the moment he was sharing with me, this guy was actually contemplating of giving up in ministry just because of things not working for him. Things were working contrary. He said, I've fasted, I've prayed, I've done this, that, and the other, but things are going contrary. And I had to encourage him and let him know that this is where hope comes in because hope is believing in the unseen and waiting for it with great expectation. That even though you don't have it, you still believe it. Even though it's not yet there, you still believe it and even though there are changes that continually happen that are contrary to your expectations you still know that god is not a man that he should lie so today again we are looking at hope the anchor of our souls and this hope is required to be translated into your mind or your soul so that you don't give up please again remember if a man does cannot lift up his mind or his uh, his mind he can never lift up his life but if a man can lift up his mind in other words if you can encourage your soul if your mind can be strong then naturally your life and destiny will find progress and you will find out that you're progressing into the future that God has intended. Now, I want us to go to Hebrews chapter number six again so that now we can be able to uh, try and connect what I'm actually speaking about. Hebrews chapter number six. Uh, let's look at this again in verses number 17. Now, the Bible talks about here, it says that God willing more abundantly to show unto other heirs or promise the immutability of his counsel. So that means the word immutability simply means that it has to be, you know, it's impossible to be broken and then he says by two immutable things two guarantees two immutable things uh things in which it is impossible for god to lie so the two things that make god not to ever drop into lies according to the scripture is the promise and the second one is the oath the word oath there is simply the covenant that god has made with us all right so there are two things that bind god to have to deliver in our lives and these are the things that our soul have to embrace so that our hope is consistent the first one is a promise and the second one is the covenant or what the bible would actually call the oath in this specific scripture so let's begin with the promise we are looking at the book of second corinthians chapter second corinthians chapter number one and verses number 20. now a promise is simply a word that has been given okay uh, that has been given to create 
uh, good possibilities or uh, uh, to to give a a, a, po a, 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 a I'm trying to look for the right word, a, a, a good future, a future that creates great expectation. Uh, that's what a promise would be. Somebody promises you that they will do something. Basically, they can never give you a negative promise. If somebody gives you a promise, each one of them has to be good. So it, he, they generate some level of expectation when a promise is actually available. So when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 20, uh, these are the words that Paul actually speaks to us. And he says this, for all the promises of God in him, check this out, in him are ye and in him amen unto the glory of god by us so every promise god gives to us is yes and every promise god gives to us is amen now remember the bible says because of these two immutable things it god therefore cannot lie the two immutable things number one is the promise now the promise is what the bible explains here when paul is speaking god says my promises in me are already yes and my promises in me are already amen now what that means anytime the promise of god is known to you the moment you actually come into the knowledge of the promise then you should know that that promise is already a yes and you should also know that that promise is already an amen. An amen simply means that it is a guarantee it is coming to pass. So that is what makes God not a liar. Because when God speaks, because promises comes by verbalizing. When God speaks, the moment his word is known to you or is heard by you, it binds him to have to perform it. The Bible says in John chapter number 1 and verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God and His Word are one and the same thing. So the moment you come into contact with a promise in Scripture, and you get to know the promise in Scripture, the knowledge of that promise then brings you into the yes of the promise and the amen of the promise. That automatically binds God, because God cannot lie, because Him and His Word are the same. So we go to the book of Numbers chapter number 23, and let's check out this scripture. I've always been quoting it, but I just want us now to read it so that it can now be able to make sense. Now, God is actually speaking when there is this particular fellow who is trying to throw enchantments against the children of Israel. And in the process of trying to do so, this same man makes some confession. Numbers 23 and verses number, uh, number, number 19. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Repent means to take back what he has spoken. Repent. He has said it he shall i mean he has said have he said it uh, and shall he not do it has he spoken it shall he not make it good so when a word proceeds from god and is heard by his people it's a yes when a word proceeds from god and is heard by his people is an amen and those words are what what we know as his promises his promises are a guarantee they bind him to have to fulfill what he has already said now the only challenge is that many believers have never really come into contact with these promises so when they do not come into contact with these promises and allow their minds to come into it the promises therefore still keep on becoming elusive in their lives. I want to repeat this. It is only a yes and an amen in him. That means you must have come into contact with it. You must have been able to hear it. You know, it means when you're reading it, it should come from the logos. Logos means a general word and it should become the rhema, which is a specific word. So that word must literally become personal to you, not general. It's not that God promised that we will all get healed. That's general. It's not that God said we will all prosper. That is general. It must become a specific word to you, a rhema word that you came into contact with during a specific time that you can actually remember God spoke it. It is mine. It is personal. So you know very well that that specific day you conceived a word. And that word was a promise that God uttered into your soul and you know it and you are sure you conceived it. There are things that God does in our hearts through the promise of his word that literally bind him to have to cause it to come to pass. And like we have read the book of 1, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 20, his promises in him are yes and they are amen. So when we come into contact with him and in contact with his promises which are verbalized, then automatically it's a yes and an amen. So it binds God. But our minds have to also believe that. It binds God. Our minds have to know that God cannot lie when he spoke his promise. It binds God. It makes us know that God has already uttered it. There is no other option. If he doesn't deliver, it makes him a liar. And Bishop Oedepo says, the same way a woman, can, a man rather, can never get pregnant no matter what, is the same way it is impossible for God to lie. It has to enter us that when that promise is verbalized, when it is spoken, when it becomes personal to us, then it binds 
is God to have to deliver what he has actually uttered. Now let's go to the second level which is the oath. Now the oath here talks of his covenant. All right. So we will go to Hebrews chapter <clears throat> number 8. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 8. We are looking at the covenant of God. In Hebrews chapter <clears throat> number 8. Uh, we will read verses number six. The scripture says this. It says, but now have he obtained a more excellent ministry. Now, <clears throat> this talks of Jesus. A more excellent ministry by how much? Also, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Oath and covenant is the same. So, promises and covenant interrelate it is on the foundation of a covenant the promises are made a covenant the promises are actually made available it's like a woman and a man the moment you make vows when you make the vows you're actually getting into a covenant but in the process of making the covenant there are promises you make to make the covenant become solid so verse number seven uh, the bible says verse number six rather that is a mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises verse number seven says for if the first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second verse number eight for finding fault with them he saith behold the days come say the lord i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah verses <clears throat> number nine I mean, Hebrews chapter number eight, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and I and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Verse number 10, for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put the laws in their minds. I will put the laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So I want you to notice that God says this covenant will be different from the cold covenant of old. The covenant of old had to be written on a tablet and had to be confessed to them and they had to do practical things in order to catch up with it. The covenant of the New Testament comes by accepting Christ. It comes by accepting Christ, who is a mediator. Accepting Jesus in your life, giving you access into agreement with God. All right? And bringing you into the family of God, number one. And in accepting Christ, the Bible says now, in this new covenant, he will put the laws in your mind and he will write them in your heart. So there are two dimensions that God is actually making clear that this covenant has to be put as laws in your mind. So which means you have to understand the scriptures. You have to understand because when he talks of laws here, he talks of the scriptures the scriptures are the covenant not just the promises of god this is the covenant of god for us through jesus himself so when we understand this when we understand the word when we understand what god did through christ when we understand the purpose as to why jesus died and had to rise again on the behalf of humanity and why he had to shed his blood on the face of the earth in understanding that and coming into knowledge of that then that law that word now becomes inscribed in our minds it now becomes an envisionment within our thinking that means the covenant now begins to translate our way translate our way of thinking we think like it thinks okay so let's check out colossians chapter number three and verse number one so that we can keep on digging deeper colossians three and verse number one for if ye have therefore been risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ seated on the right hand of the father so that means the moment we came into christ they are things that we have been called to begin to seek after we have to live in the reality of what jesus died and resurrected to become verse number three number two rather the bible says set in your mind your affections on the things that are above not on the things which are on earth verse number three for you are dead and your life is hid with christ in god you are dead and your life is hid in christ in god so when we got born again we were brought into this covenant now this covenant according to hebrews chapter number eight the bible explains has to be put in your mind and has to be written in your heart i will repeat again when a hope is naturally in your heart which talks of your spirit man it believes your spirit man does believe but a hope needs to be translated into your mind your soulish realm so that by the time it comes translated into that position then you will notice that your imaginations begin to be anchored in that your thoughts begin to be anchored in that covenant 
So that means if anything happened to you, in your mind, you already said, you know God cannot lie. In your mind, you're already sure that God will deliver whatever he actually has promised. You know why the Bible calls Abraham the father of faith? Is because when Abraham heard from God, the Bible says the moment he heard from God, he believed. And the Bible says that was counted for him as a righteousness. It was counted for him as righteousness. What it means is because of that belief, Abraham was translated. So if you study the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, the Bible says Abraham sought after a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So Abraham was already translated. You couldn't stop him. God just commanded him, come out. And Abraham came out, Genesis chapter number 12. And he had never ever met God, but just one encounter in Genesis 12 and verse 1, and yet he was an idol worshiper, made him live where he was and made the decision to begin to follow after God. His mind was set. He knew very well that God will deliver according to what he has spoken. You know, these are the things that I want you to understand. That whenever we are dealing with hope, hope has to be an anchor of your soul. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 6, the scripture we have read, that there are two, these two immutable things guarantee and they make God not a liar. And those two immutable things are what we have actually mentioned, the promise, and number two, the covenant. God has already given us his promise. Learn to come into contact with his promises. And remember, his promise must be verbalized. It must be verbalized. It's not just to be known. The covenant has to be known and understood and lived by but when we are dealing with the promise it has to be verbalized it cannot be on the logos reality the promise has to come into the reality of being rema it must be personal it must be your own personal word romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of god so it is what you hear twice that is a rhema to you that you are able to possess it is only in repetition that people find establishment so that's one of the things that you have to understand that the promise comes by the utterance of the word the promise therefore has to be something that you know you can't take it as a third party and yet the covenant is something that you must come into knowledge of and something that you must practice continually. The covenant is something that you must come into knowledge of. And that's why the Bible says, I will put my law in this covenant in their minds and I will write it. I will inscribe it into their hearts. So you must come into knowledge of the covenant because if you do not know the covenant you're in, then you cannot be able to claim the rights or the benefits that are behind that covenant. You must know it and you must activate it continually. In fact, today, during the lunch hour, I'm actually dealing with a series that I've been teaching on activating priesthood. And so I've started dealing with the aspect of sacrifices. I spoke about two types of sacrifices yesterday. The sacrifices of God according to the book of Psalms, chapter number 51 and verse 16. And the sacrifices of righteousness according to Psalms 51 and verse 19. Now the two of these are actually sacrifices every believer has been called to offer. Sacrifices of God talks of a broken spirit, talking of humility. You know, if you will ever, ever have encounters with God, and I explained you yesterday i said altars thrive on the power of the quality of its sacrifice and i explained to people yesterday that the quality of sacrifices you lay on your altar determines the voice the power and the impact you will ever make and the first one is a sacrifice of humility it takes a person to humble themselves before god the second one are the sacrifices of righteousness which means submission or giving yourself to obedience to kingdom principles in practice of it continually now this is the same thing that i'm actually trying to mention today i will be actually going deeper talking of other sacrifices sacrifices of your own body and other sacrifices which i don't want you to miss today when i'll be talking about it in lunch hour but i want you to take this a bit seriously that when we are dealing with covenants you have to understand that the covenants of god are very critical so one of the sacrifices i'll be dealing with is the sacrifices of christ which is the ultimate sacrifice it's a superior sacrifice when jesus gave his own son just one was enough he gave one sacrifice once and for all and it was acceptable before god so the ultimate sacrifice is a sacrifice that christ was able to offer but that sacrifice can you imagine still has to be known that's where the covenant is and it has to be activated so that's why many people usually really do not see the benefits of salvation so i will repeat i'm talking about the anchor of our souls and i'm building this scripture i'm building this uh, text from the book of hebrews chapter number six verse number 17 and verses number 18 in verse number 18 again the, again the bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for god to lie impossible 
for God to lie. And the two immutable things is that in your mind, always remember his promises. Let it register in your mind over and over and let your mind constantly hear the promises of God. Two, in your mind, always remember the covenant, the oath. The second immutable thing is the oath. The covenant God has made. God cannot break his covenant. He has already done it through Christ. It's a guarantee he will bring it to pass. But your mind has to envision it and your mind has to bring you to the practicality of always activating this covenant. Praise God. Well, I think I'm done for today and I'm praying for you that your, uh, your mind or your soul will become anchored in hope. I want to repeat this again that if this thing is only in your spirit man and your mind or your, or your soul is not translated into believing these things, you will notice you will struggle with what we are actually teaching. But if you believe it, it will be a reality. So I want to say God bless you. I trust that you have been blessed with today's lesson. My prayer for you is that these things will become a strong point in your life. I also want you to make an effort, keep on listening to them over and over so that your mind believes what your spirit already has conceived. Let your mind be translated into the same possibilities and see how God will begin to take you from one level of glory to the other. Several experiences in him will begin to work for you. Things you have been hoping and waiting on God to fulfill, he will make it come to pass. May this be your reality. I speak a blessing to you, a blessing to all that concerns you. I pray that the Lord will perfect everything about your life and that for every expectation you've been having, may God bring speed to you and fulfill all your expectations and desires in the mind name of Jesus Christ. I pray that any sense of hopelessness or giving up that you've had within you, may God release you from it and may God cause you not to faint, but give you power to believe again in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're blessed of God. I pray for you to continually move in grace and move in the strength of God that you will hope even allowing hope to become the anchor of your soul. As I close, I want to give three quick announcements. Number one, obviously, I want you to join me for lunch hour today. You don't need to miss it because it will be extremely powerful. So be with me today as I'm still speaking on activating priesthood and I'm now dealing with the power of sacrifices. I don't want you to miss it. Then I also want you to be with me uh, this Friday on the 18th when I will be doing my book launch. Two books that I'm launching, one on leadership calling leading, called Leading into Destiny and the second one is on uh, uh, what we call finances called money attracts money. Two powerful books I've been able to author. I want you just to come in and be blessed. If you're an elder, please, I want you to make the effort and come and join me. We are at Komora Center, fourth floor. We will be doing this on Friday at exactly 6 p.m. East African time. We will be on here. I want you to come, 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 come from everywhere. Come and be blessed. Entry is only 1500 but, but, but if you do a pre-order, it will actually only cost you 1200 You will get a discount, in other words. So you can be able just to go ahead and do a pre-order. You can use the numbers I've been able to post, or you can check out my uh, my account, just my uh, Pan Pastor Pancras account, and you will follow through. You will see all the announcements and the details, a pay bill number or the phone number in which you can be able to pre-order. And from there, you can now be able to come in with a pre-order, which will have given you a discount, and it will be able to help you to get the two books and also get get some, uh, some, some snacks in which we will have, apart from the celebration we'll be having as we launch in the book. So please, I need you to be a part of this on Friday. Be there and at least commit yourself to be a part of what God is doing. Lastly, next week we might take a bit of a change, uh, but I will get to announce this. Uh, that is in the program. We might be doing it at around 7 or 7.30 p.m. Monday, Tuesday. We just want to see whether evening can also work for many people to tune in as for next week. That is for this program, Therapia. But this week we will still continue at exactly Exactly 12 10. That is 10 minutes past 12 East African time. We will still be on. Thank you for joining me. If you want to be a blessing in terms of your offering, the numbers are actually available right there. You can be able to communicate through that number just to sow in a seed or be a partner and God will bless you. Love you all. Good to see you, Pastor Eunice. Uh, Opicha, good to see you. Rebecca, I've just seen you right now. Regina, thank you for having joined me, Pastor Sam. And all of you, God bless you. I trust you're blessed. Join me for lunch hour. Then tomorrow, 10 minutes past 12, uh, past 12, we'll be back here. And Friday, please. Please, we have a date. Make sure you join me for the book launch. Love you all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.